was. Um, one train I'm aware of, uh, they used about a ton of gunpowder over the weekend as the lines of dancers, so-called dancers, <coughs> with their muskets moved backwards and forwards across the square, shooting in the air and making a lot of noise and things like this. Fighting for the young woman up this tower, uh, which is made of cardboard, at least in this particular place, uh, and so on. Um, it's great fun and hard to see the connection between Morris dancing as we know it. Um, I have seen films of Spanish and Portuguese stick dancers and sword dancers, um, and like the bus, they do these dances, but basically, in our terms, they do continuous stick movements. They don't have the figures, right? Um, if it, I've tried works, I tried a workshop with Great Western many years ago, um, with um, the bus dances, high kicks. Well, first of all, none of them could kick their foot higher than their waist. None of them could kick them head high. You have to start somewhat younger, I think, to do that sort of thing. Um, but it actually essentially was not interesting. You know, um, I fain with Fleet Morris that the, there's some very good stick, tap, tip, stick tapping dancers in the bus repertoire of bus scenes that come to the UK. But they fit in with a tradition like Litchfield. You know, you need the figures and things like this to fit in with that. Um, I believe that we're mature enough in this country <coughs> we can adopt elements from other, t other nations' traditions, which is a thing that very much worried the EFTSS um, in its early its first 50 years. You know, they believe probably quite rightly that adopting bits from elsewhere would change the tradition. And I think it's so embedded with us nowadays, this is not a risk anymore, still. Um, yeah, there are trade links. Unfortunately, the trade links start about 1550. Um, Elizabeth I was excommunicated by the Pope, which left English traders free to trade with Morocco and Algeria in a way that the rest of Europe wasn't. We were able to make deals with the um, pirates along the coast. Now, the pirates were quite serious. They raided uh, Cornwall and Devon. That's a raid about here, I suppose. Um, and the Irish coast and so on. Um, landing and just picking up people with slaves and so on. Um, the, um, in the, uh, during the Civil War, um, uh, a man from um, Burnham, that's right, Burnham was he, uh, Richard somebody or other, who's um, the museum at Burnham is a bait the man. Um, he led a navy to try and suppress the pirates. The technology uh, that he had available with his boats and so on was not enough. He could sink the boats so that they could build fresh ones within a few weeks. So that was no, prop, no um, solution. But starting from then, anyhow, there was a battle which didn't end until the middle of the 19th century of dealing with the pirates. And it only ended then because the French decided that the only way to deal with the pirates is to take the North African coast over. So they invaded Tunisia, Algeria and Morocco and the Spanish invaded Morocco, so on, up to then. But the more um, culture through this period did not generate the sort of thing that we would call Morris. What was being developed in the rich culture in Spain, in Toledo and so on, is another matter. Um, what you have to appreciate is that the Arab culture brought the culture of the classic era into Spain to translate into Arabic. And then people from France and Italy and Germany went to Toledo to translate into their languages to take back to fame the universities like Oxford and Cambridge uh, and Paris uh, and so on uh, to spread the classic culture around. We owe a lot to um, the Muslims of this period and what they did. But the um, caliphs and so on who ran the kingdoms in Spain owe no duty to the Ottoman Turks back in Istanbul or Constantinople. You know, the world 
it was they were too far apart. It, it's a very confused history. Uh, UNESCO did their best after the war when they were formed to write the history of these things. I have some volumes, they're about four inches thick uh, for centuries and so on. And I can assure you that having read them my all the way through, they didn't help me understand the origins of Morris whatsoever. Um, but go to the Victorian Albert Museum. Go to the Moresque um, Gallery and see the examples of the products. Swords, ironwork, metalwork, um, cloth, decoration and so on. It was the word used to find the best that was available. Certainly about 1500, um, the best swords in the world were uh, the Moresque swords. The best spears in the world were there. I talked to the man, um, like, oh, I wish I could remember that. I should have written these names down, you know. The man who was teaching English martial arts for the period. And he um, has a fine collection of uh, Moresque instruments. They are the best for the period and so on. They were what people went for where they could. If you wanted the best cloth, the best silks, you got them from the, from the Spanish, the Moors um, working in Spain and so on. And that's probably why it's called Moors. Now I have one nagging suspicion about this explanation. There's a man from the 13th century called Morris. It was a surname. Uh, right in the early days of surnames being adopted by people in this country. So it could still be there. Yeah. Oh, I have to say, country dance is because those people who owned houses believed in town and country. Urban and country house, as it were. It has nothing to do with the people who lived in the country. They were peasants. Social dancing was modelled on that adopted by the aristocracy and at court because um, the emphasis certainly by the Tudor period was that everybody who was somebody went to court and stopped actually wearing uh, tin uh, iron ch chain mail and tin coats and things of that sort um, and had to learn to dance. If you were anybody, you could dance well. People... Men learned to do the galliard. You know, really, um, a Morris jig would lend it many more steps and so on. You know, it was the finest thing. I have never found any connection between the galliard steps that are recorded and what we do in the Morris, you know, the galleys and, and hooks and things of that sort. Um, but you can see there could have been a, a connection and so on. Um, yeah. 1843, Ethiopia, Ethiopian um, band came to England to um, initiate the start of blackface minstrelsy. And today, um, for very good reason, we don't like to remember the fact that the most popular entertainment from 1850 up to the First World War in London and the Midlands was blackface minstrelsy. People who were singers or stand-up comedians found they had to go blackface to be actually be popular. People wanted it. It had nothing to do um, in this country with the Negro population because there was very little of it. I'm afraid the problem, the social problem, was really generated in the States. I don't really want to go into it, um, but talking to my parents' generation and so on, um, the Americans that came over in both the First World War and the Second World War um, were really the problem as far as we were concerned. Um, and I, I have many stories to tell, but uh, not today. Um, but blacking up, 
In the late 18th century, poaching, the poaching war, um, because the game laws were passed and people were starving because um, they weren't allowed to go um, gather game and so on, poaching came right and there were real battles between gamekeepers and people poaching and um, they passed the Black Act. Anybody seen wearing a scarf over their face or blacked up there are uh, assumed to be a poaching unless they could prove otherwise afterwards. And it is not something that ordinary people did. Certainly, in all the references up to 1750 that Mike Heaney and um, the American put together, there's only one mention of blacking up. In the same way with Morris, there's only one mention of sticks in this early period. Uh, the sticks were introduced from the Midlands. Um, that's another story again, of course. Um, the other aspect we've got to think about, the Morris, is seasonal. In terms of dances related to the seasons, traditionally around the world, the men did the hunting dances, the women did the, the planting uh, fertility dances, basically. And it was done for fertility when you planted. Now, as you know, ploughing starts on Play Monday, and you try to get the seed in by Candlemas, which is early February. The fertility season is actually when you're planting right at the start. By the time you get to May Day, if the things haven't shot and are growing well, you know you've got a problem, but there's no point in dancing around to encourage things and so on. It's already happened. Yeah, you're, you're in trouble or not. But it's the period uh, from Easter to uh, May Day on the old calendar, the period when it was slack time in the countryside. And by slack time, it's a time you could do something else. That's when May Day was celebrated more or less everywhere in the country. Kids went, went, went to in gardens. People went out in the evening or the morning with May songs. Uh, Morris dancers went out if that's what they had, and so on. You know, no, it's all um, about that sort of time. Morris dancers could take the week off, and so on. Then the other opportunity they had is that um, when it, the season, when the harvest season started, um, the harvest starts in the um, the small holdings around the towns. In other words, people who are actually growing things early to feed the urban population and so on, who are harvesting a week, few weeks ahead of the main harvest in the countryside, which actually the main harvest was putting in the store for the deep winter and so on. So the Morris dancers would go up to London or up to the big towns anyhow and dance. Now having said that, by 1840, it was being noted in the newspapers the Morris dancers were not appearing in London anymore. They were gradually giving up uh, it was not actually paying off, and so on. Um, the mid-1800s were a poor time uh, for the peasants anyhow. Food was down, average height had shrunk by three or four inches, and so on, as far as graveyards are concerned, and so on. A bad time for people, and so on. So things were dying out. And that partly contributed, I think, to the loss of the Morris. Uh, yes, we do know of stories of... Morris dances in the safe. Um, Lucy Baldwin met one um, in the Horsham area. There were Morris dances at Old Woking in Farnborough in the late Victorian time, uh, and so on. Um, Morris dances at Shaftesbury. Um, there were relics, as it were, but was no longer a common costume and so on. We were lucky. Um, oh, the other thing about May Day is that <laughs> that was the traditional day where you took the sheep up on the hills. And the shepherd, or the herdsman in general, disappeared for the summer. So again, uh, 
any opportunity for young men to do something or other disappeared at that sort of time. You know, um, it's really... The way things were, the way of life for people was different. Now, they were not the only reasons why we had um, dancing or celebrations. This is Great Wishford, or Wishford Magnet, as it used to be, near Salisbury. But since about 1600, it's turned out on the 29th of May. It used to be a May Day custom because they... They took the Earl of Pembroke, who was newly created, to court to establish their customary rights in Grovely Wood. Um, they and the Berwick St. James, the other side. And they won. And they were able to say, in time immemorial, we had rights to do this, that and the other, and the new Earl of Pembroke can't stop us from doing it. But the Earl of Pembroke was very clever. He said, right. You can keep these rights for as long as you do the customary dance up to the cathedral. Right? So for many years, they danced all the way from Wishford to the cathedral. About 10 miles. Oh, quite there. Um, in the 19th century, it got a bit wearisome, and the locals stopped doing it. But four women kept the dance, the whole custom life. They trotted, as it were, up to the cathedral and read the Charter 8 to themselves in the cathedral. Somewhere about the uh, beginning of the 20th century, uh, they formed the Oak Apple Club. Now, it moved to the 29th of May because the calendar had changed. As you remember, we lost 13 days and suddenly May Day was too early for May to be in blossom. Now you can't, May Day is not quite the way it was, but the 29th of May at the other end was a very good day for having a similar celebration. So they celebrated um, um, the Great Wishford Day on the 29th of May. They go up every year at 10 o'clock on the 29th of May, they arrive at uh, Salisbury Cathedral, they erect the banner, March up to the cathedral. The dance is done by four women dressed in the dress of the four women who kept things alive in the back end of the 19th century. They go inside the cathedral. The, their, their own vicar comes up with them. They read a bit from the charter. They stand up shouting, Grobly, Grobly, and all Grobly, unity is strength, and leave there and go back to the village. And then they have their fate. They have a carnival procession. And when I went to the Carnival Procession the first time, it was all Carnival Procession, there was no spectators. Everybody in the village had dressed up and was on a float, you know. Um, then they have a, um, the field in the middle of the village, a marquee set up, everybody who lived in the village went had dinner there, and the afternoon was a typical fete, maypole dancing, etc., etc. Of many For many years now, Bourne River of the Morris has come along and danced, and they add that little bit, modern this bit, to the whole thing and so on. And it's a great day. And again, if you're not that far away, the 29th of May, both the cathedral and the solemnity on to and the village um, celebration and so on, is something to actually meet. It is very seldom that nowadays you can actually meet a custom being done by local people to a local audience. When I first went to Abbots Bromley and had to bake up, we were the only visitors. It was the locals, and it was great to see what it was like in a local context. Uh, today, they turn up in their coach loads to do it. It's a wonderful experience, but not the way it was, right? Um, I think that's enough messages to get over for the moment. Oh, no. <laughs> I can't resist this one. May Day in Urban Pain. Jack in the Green, Chimney Sweeps. Now, it can't be an ancient custom because chimneys didn't appear in Tudor time, till Tudor times, right? And ch chimneys in those days were big enough to send small children up. 
In fact, they didn't actually get too small until relatively modern times. Right? Um, the idea of going out on May Day occurred not only to chimney sweeps, 